My first question is always, can you just talk us through your career? Where did you start? How did you get to where you are today? Paint the picture of your career history a little bit more for us. Sure, absolutely. So um, some people will know this, but banking is in my DNA. Um, longtime banker, my dad was, um, I think over 40 years in the banking industry. So I kind of grew up with it, to be honest. Um, and from there, my first my first job in the bank was as a teller at 16. I don't think we hire that young any longer, but um, I thought it was just a fantastic way to deal with customer service. I absolutely loved it. I loved Saturdays when lineups were out the door and and um, the elderly population would wait to uh, to greet me on their uh, on their weekly visit to the bank. Um, so it was a great background. Put me through school. And then from there, um, went on to UBC, which is now Sauter. And I was immediately drawn to finance and economics courses. Uh, not, not surprising, but those were really where I ended up landing the bulk of my courses. Um, after that, it was, it was a really tough economic environment when I graduated. Um, I went into the bank again, and um, but after two years, I was getting restless. I really wanted to do something different. I went to Toronto, to the Uni University of Toronto, and did my MBA there um, with a, with a uh, focus in, guess what, finance. Um, and it was, it was great. Sometimes MBAs aren't as complimentary, but this one, I think, was a deeper dive in finance, so I really enjoyed that. Um, but more importantly, it really introduced me into the Toronto capital markets system. Uh, we heard various presentations. Kids get these all the time now. Um, but back then, you almost had to wait for your MBA. And investment banker came in and gave a presentation. And I thought, oh, my goodness, that's what I want to do. And so I focused my efforts on that. And 27 years later, here I am, same bank, same career. Um, but it's really grown, uh, you know, the opportunities. And I think the biggest thing for me is the attraction to the technology sector specifically. Um, when I came into investment banking, we didn't have a dedicated group focused on technology. Um, myself and a managing director spun off a group within CIBC. And we loved working with entrepreneurs. We were probably the loudest investment bankers in the group and the most dynamic. And so I think it was a natural fit for us to um, really enjoy working with entrepreneurs that are fast paced, that are creative and really want to make a difference. And to this day, it's one of my favorite sectors to focus on. Wow. Well, we are lucky to have such a passionate uh, champion in you. Um, now, listen, I was, I was mentioning it a little bit when we were running our polls, but you know, these markets are, are different um, than we've enjoyed for the last 10 years or so. And uh, you were so kind as to share your insights on capital markets uh, at the TIAs, uh, as you always do. And it, it's always a highlight for people who are there. But for those who weren't there, uh, or perhaps to give people a bit of an update, would you mind just sharing some of those insights again? Because they were so useful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, it, you know, I think it really did kick off with the rising interest rates. Um, with those rising interest rates, the, the, there was a rotation, and this happens all the time in the market, there's a rotation out of those companies with high growth. Um, into more stable sectors. And so we saw that rotation happen. It not only is affecting technology, but it's also affecting other industries in the BC economy that we're all familiar with, in particular on um, consumer growth. So whether that's direct to consumer or things like that. So this rotation has happened. Um, I think what is interesting is that, and people forget, is that really the software valuations that people are focused on have have mean reverted. They've mean reverted back to say the pre 2019 levels. So we've seen these levels again. Um, I think it's just the dramatic fall and how quickly it happened and, and the level that it happened. Um, and in particular, I know we did the poll around your revenue growth, but where we've seen the most dramatic 
shifting evaluation are those that have grown, say, 30% plus. We track it in all different bands, and those software companies that were growing 30% plus, they've seen the most dramatic drop in valuation uh, from, say, 24 times forward revenue at the absolute peak um, to more in and around the, the five times level that we're seeing today. And so, you know, what has this happened? What is, how has this impacted, say, the financing market? Um, we're in the biggest IPO drought we've seen in 20 years. Uh, you would have seen lots of really interesting companies go public during the last wave. And of course, that IPO activity has dried up. Um, the other area that is impacted quite dramatically is that late stage VC crossover growth equity stage of capital raising. Um, you know, the Tiger Global, the SoftBank, Dragoneer, they really drove not only the valuation level, the sheer volume of um, financing that was raised, um, but with the drop in public valuations, a lot of these funds have largely just exited. They've, they've stopped investing. Um, and so of course that really impacts that side of the equation. Um, what we haven't seen, we haven't seen a lot of down rounds and I know there's a lot of VCs here in the local market and conversations with them solidifies this, which is um, companies are doing what's right. They're extending their runway, preserving that cash. And so making the necessary choices that need to be made. Um, existing investors are writing top-up investments for their existing portfolio companies. And companies are also looking for non-dilutive capital. CIBC Innovation Banking, for example, we call it unicorn fuel. And we're helping those companies extend their runway by writing non-dilutive capital to them from our balance sheet. Um, we do anticipate down rounds are inevitable. We'll start to see them. Um, so it'll be interesting as, as that starts to roll out. Um, the other market that obviously we're watching very closely is the M&A market. And when valuations are dropping quite dramatically, there's always this reset period um, between what sellers are expecting. Of course, they would love to get what was being offered even 6, 12, 18 months ago uh, versus the buyers in the market and what they, they were almost waiting for the economic stability and the valuations to settle out. So there's this period that often happens where there's a bit of a pause in the market. Now we have seen some uh, pretty substantial takeover activi activity in particular um, from large public companies in the US where valuations have just dropped to such a level that private equity is now stepping in and they're looking to transact. Plus, we've got over a trillion U.S. in dry powder if you look at tech private equity and you look at tech M&A as well. So there is quite a bit of dry powder out there looking to get to work. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is strategics. Um, they would have largely been out of the market for quite a while as they thought valuation levels were just too high. But we're seeing strategics much more active in getting back into the market and looking for complementary acquisitions to kind of fuel their growth. Um, and then finally, another theme, and we did talk about it really briefly at the TIAs, but um, we're, and we're seeing this in our own deal flow, is that you've got private equity looking at, say, mergers of two venture capital-backed companies, and the private equity firm comes in over the top, and they look to provide additional capital and what they're getting with that is they're getting access into two great companies that are complementary in some way and looking to fuel them for further growth as they have additional scale and also look for capital efficiency in their balance sheet. So we think um, 23 is going to be busy. It's going to be busy. It's going to be turbulent. Um, and, you know, obviously at uh, CIBC, we're happy to provide advice uh, for those that are out there. Um, looking to navigate kind of these interesting times. Listen, one of the things that I think you are so uniquely placed to talk about and that uh, our members would really appreciate uh, your insights on is you've seen multiple cycles. You've seen up cycles, you've seen down cycles, you've seen that stabilization phase. For lots of people, for lots of founders, this is the first time that they're encountering a different market condition in, in really quite a while. And I wonder, just with your experience, maybe looking back to the first tech boom in VC and 
what were the learnings out of that? Or yeah, and it, it is a scary, it is scary when you're you're in it for the first time and you know, you had capital providers that were pushing you to grow faster and do more. And um, and and now the, the tone has changed. So the, the tone has really changed to your you're back to good business fundamentals. And that's gonna be really critical. Um, when money was essentially free, companies were blitzscaling. They were hiring like crazy and they were putting people out to, to work on expanding the revenue base. And, and then you know, a little bit of bad practices gets mixed in there because it's just too fast, too fast, too much. Um, but I think now with capital efficiency being a really important uh, fundamental tenant that investors are looking for, I think it's, um, it's back to using your cash, your capital in a really, in, you know, a really profitable way. And so the, the focus is back. I mean, we track um, regression of revenue growth versus uh, valuation multiples of companies. And before it was all tied. So, you know, revenue growth and valuation multiples were directly correlated. Um, now what we're seeing is it's back to that rule of 40. And so that's a combination of revenue growth plus profitability is more closely tied to valuation. And whether that's valuation in private markets, public markets, or m and it's kind of similar themes that likely companies are going to start to hear more and more about. Um, so then I guess the question becomes, how do you create value for the long term? And um, I think investors, existing investors, future investors, they want to support that. They want to support creating value for the long term. And many of the best public companies that are out there today, or, or not even public, but generally, you know, large category leaders like Google, like Square, like Uber, they were created in pretty tough times. Um, and so you think about when you're created in tough times, you do things differently. You have that rigor, that grit, that ability to find value. Um, whereas maybe you, and you have to work harder to find that value. So, you know, make the, make the hard decisions now, extend your runway, um, look for capital. And I saw that there is an upcoming um, seminar on, on capital. So attend that seminar. <laughs> um, cause I think you have to look for capital in all places, whether it's government grants, um, making sure that you're utilizing all those different opportunities that are out there. I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, the other thing is tap into your tech ecosystem. And that's what, you know, the TIA is, the BCTIA is all about is making sure you've got that tech ecosystem because there are lots of folks that have been through the ups and the downs. They've been, you know, 27 years in the, <laughs> in the industry and longer. Um, there's some fantastic super angels that are out there that people know and tap into those folks, taps into those that created the, you know, 15, 20 year overnight success. And um, I think a lot of people know who those, those folks are as well, but figure, you know, actually reach out to them and figure out how did they get through this? What are different lessons that they learned? And by speaking through it, you'll, you'll be amazed at what ideas come out of that. That's fantastic. That, that, that's just such great wisdom and, and also quite positive, right? There are things you can do and yes. it will, we will come through this and it will not last forever. We'll probably be amazed at how quickly things change again, but there's some clear things you can do right now to take more control. Uh, so I mentioned off the top, Kathy, that you are such a huge supporter of the TIAs, of BC Tech generally, but of the TIAs, and we're so thankful for that. Um, it, it's unique, actually, sometimes at the TIAs, you get this flavor year by year. You watch how the ecosystem changes because you get this moment in time when you know we get together with 800 of our closest friends and and see how things are, are developing is there anything notable for you in how bc's tech ecosystem has evolved over recent years yeah and there i always have a level of optimism <laughs> um, over the past 20 years and but you know that optimism has only grown in the last couple of years um, and I think the big thing is this tech ecosystem has really expanded and you can't have just one leg of the tech ecosystem working. It's not like that. You have to have all of them working and they have to all feed off of each other. And that's where um, that's why BC has grown in respect on a global basis, because that tech ecosystem 
has grown and continues to grow. So there's there's a lot of optimism around it. I, I'd say right across Canada and into our global um, international stage as well. Um, so a couple of things I think that provide that tech ecosystem. I, I talked about the super angels. Those people are really important and they continue to grow in numbers because as companies say get acquired um, and folks go on and from that business, then they come back into other businesses to lend not only their capital, but also their expertise. And so you'll see them sprinkled across boards, cap tables, into management teams. And some of those companies that are shining stars have come from different past leaders in our industry. So that, that is a really, really important point of the tech ecosystem. Uh, the depth of talent is really important, obviously. And as you bring people into British Columbia, they fall in love with it, uh, whether that's senior executives or employees. Um, and those people stay. They stay, they bring their families, and they become embedded in our community. And so having that depth of talent in our tech ecosystem is really important. Um, and obviously our universities and colleges are fantastic. And so that, that builds off of our employee base as well. Um, another key contributor is, is private capital. You have to have capital available to our companies at the right stage of their growth and where the need is the greatest. So we've got our super angels. We've got more and more venture capital firms here. That would be the difference. Um, from say a decade ago is just a smaller group of local venture capital firms that were writing checks. Um, so as we get more locally here, their funds are growing, they're writing more checks and they are looking for co-investors into other pockets of, of the world. Um, but I would say also um, those, the outreach from venture capital firms in the US, in Europe, in Asia have really picked up over the last many years. And once they get one investment here, um, they want more investments here because they start to come here. They're like, wow, this is, this, I didn't realize there was such a great ecosystem here and they want to write more checks. And so more companies get funded out of, out of the Vancouver or broader British Columbia market. Um, and then of course, our, our province, they set aside the $500 million for NBC to start investing as well. Um, I know we're all impatient and uh, we want to see checks get deployed faster here. They're in the fund stage, so they're writing checks into funds. Um, but I'm excited to see where they're gonna put that money from a direct investment perspective. Um, they've got different tenants that they're following in terms of their investment policy. Um, but you know, we're excited to see them move the needle here in the province where some of the companies need that funding the most. That's excellent, thank you. That's really, that's a that's a that's a great overview. Um, there's a fantastic question uh, in the chat that I'd like to go to right now. It just picks up on what you were saying, Kathy. So, has the risk appetite changed here, in your view? Yes, <laughs> um, I think across the board. I think across the board, uh, the risk appetite has changed. It um, it's why there haven't been any IPOs. Um, right off the bat. So investors, they don't want to put money into something and the next day volatility hits the market and the, the stock drops right off the bat. Um, what they would rather do is they would just rather invest in the existing portfolio of companies that are out there. Um, on the private side, same thing. There still is nervousness around the general economic environment, political environment, interest rate environment. Um, looking for that stabilization as well. And so it goes into that risk off environment. Um, on the M&A side, same thing. You know, the strategics want to deploy capital. They want to grow their business. They want to make sure their underlying business is stable um, and they've got a handle on it before they go out and do another acquisition, which would increase the risk of success of, of their business. So I would say the risk appetite has definitely changed. Um, but once again, you know, we've got fantastic investors that um, they take a longer view. So they're willing to underwrite that risk. They're not out of the market entirely. Um, they're still looking at deals. They're still writing checks. They're still looking for opportunities. And the, the ones that are bold are the ones that have been through multiple cycles. And those are the ones that are going to come through and support those companies and find, find the great capital. That's great. But as you said, there's 
Um, their risk appetites definitely change. There's hesitancy because of risk in so many yeah. different ways, but there's also the pressure of that dry powder. Uh, people only make money if they deploy their capital. Yes. Capital's been raised, so capital's waiting. Yeah. And that's a positive thing for people to remember, right? That brings its own yes. So, so it, it, it's nobody's saying it will be easy or that things haven't changed, but that's uh, capital will need to be deployed at some point. And so it's all about making yourself look as investable as you can. And it's back to those fundamentals. How do you yes. present yourself? The key parts of your business case and keeping your options open, making sure you're meeting with lots of different capital providers and, and exploring the different options that are available to you. So yeah, um, that's great. Thank you. Um, I wonder if we could, uh, sorry, I'll just quickly check in the chat. Uh, oh, just a thank you. <laughs> thank you for your excellent answer. <laughs> and, then, uh, and I do encourage those who are attending the call, please do raise your questions in the chat or raise your, your hand. And we will be happy to sort of deal with those as soon as we can. Uh, I have a couple more questions for Kathy. Uh, the first one is just, you touched on this a bit, but uh, looking ahead, I know we, we share an optimistic view of BC and BC's tech sector and what the potential is, but getting more specific and more granular, um, what really excites you? What do you think the potential of the BC tech sector is? What are you watching with interest? Yeah. What are you excited about? Yeah, yeah, I think there, there's a couple things that um, I'm really excited about. I think uh, the expertise and the companies that we've got here in the province are really diversified. And I like that we are across multiple sectors. And um, so we're, we're very relevant as to, you know, what the markets are looking for, which is fantastic. So diversification, you know, we've got fantastic biotech, climate tech, software, AR, VR, um, you know, right across the board. So there's a lot of different diversity across our, our, um, our company base. Um, the other thing that's really exciting, and I, obviously this accelerated uh, during COVID, is we've got um, geographic diversification. Uh, we're headed over to the Viatech Awards next, uh, next week, and there's so much going on in the island. I think it's great. I think it's great. They've got a great community over there. They're forming their own tech ecosystem that's very complementary to the one um, on the mainland. But it, it's great to see that diversification, uh, diversification into Kelowna, Kamloops, um, right across the Kootenays, we've got companies. So I, I'm excited about that, that diversification as well. Because um, once again, we don't want necessarily the pocket of opportunity just here in the, in the, in the lower mainland. Um, so that's probably where I'm, I'm most excited is the broadening out of our tech ecosystem. Yeah, I'm excited too. And we'll see you at the Biotech Awards next Yeah, week. good. Do you have an 80s outfit? There, yeah, we have to wear 80s. The, the outfit is taking more time than we thought to completely nail down. But uh, yeah, they have an 80s theme. So it will be fun to try and uh, come up with something creative. But, uh, but I'm with you. Uh, it is exciting to see the companies that are created in Victoria and in the rest of the island, in the Okanagan, in the north. I was talking just yesterday to a leader in Prince George and some of the stuff that's happening up there. It's really exciting. Um, the other parallel piece is tech talent is everywhere these days. It doesn't, you know, whatever the headquarters of the company, we have staff in every part of this province. And uh, that's something that I'm kind of excited about for the next few years. Can we accelerate that? Can we have more work in communities that might have had a traditional uh, plant? Could they have a technology plant in their community mm -hmm. because there's a cluster of workers there? I think that would be fantastic. Um, so I'm going to turn to the audience in a moment um, to ask them if they have any questions for Kathy. So that's your cue. Be sure to drop your ideas in the chat. Um, but just before I go there, I think maybe I could ask Kathy, just reflecting back on the on the on the beginnings of your career and what you hoped for and that excitement that you were telling us about that you had about the tech sector. Um, are you glad that the focus of your career has been in in technology um, and you're looking to another 27 years? <laughs> yes, exactly. No, I'm very, very happy that this became the focus area, not only in banking. I love working with clients. Um, I love helping 
clients achieve their objectives. And so whether that's raising capital, um, accessing the public markets for the first time, uh, selling their business, buying another business, I think that you know it's a, it's a great it's a great business to to work collaboratively side by side with your clients. Um, and then on the on the technology sector, absolutely. Um, what drew me to the tech sector originally from you know, an entrepreneurial creative drive perspective, um, I think is great. And to be honest, from a female perspective, there's no barriers in technology from my perspective. <laughs> um, I think creative ideas are creative ideas and, and um, hard drive and grit. And I recently watched um, uh, one of the founders, Geo Comply, and, and she I mean, she's got grit and enthusiasm and hard work and, and uh, she would probably say there's, there's no barriers for women when you're just, you're moving ahead with your, with your business plan. So I think technology sector is great for that. Thank you. That's fantastic. Okay. Uh, here's a question in the chat. I haven't even had a chance to read it, but let, let's do it together. <laughs> so Kathy, have you seen the rise of different investment approaches? Is equity still the most popular way for investors to get a piece of early stage growth? Or are there other approaches that have become more popular as investors get in earlier and earlier on the growth curve? I would say equity is still the, the most prevalent for sure. Um, I do know a number of folks that come in and work with companies um, to help them at the initial stages and take equity back as part of compensation. So that benefits not only that young company that doesn't necessarily have cash on the balance sheet to pay out, um, but also aligns interest with those early folks coming in to help them grow their business and receive equity back. And now they're even more invested in the business. But I would say early stage, for sure, it, it remains equity into the business. Great. Okay, good. Um, and then I think, that, let me just uh, see if I've got any other questions in the chat. Oh, yes, there we are. Do you have any advice for startups on how to evaluate the capital options that are available to them? So this is really capital 101. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's a big question too. That is a big, big question. Um, I mean, there, there is, it, it is going back to, I believe, do you have a peer in your tech ecosystem that you can sit down with that's gone through that early stage investment. Um, I mean, bankers are good, but generally we're a little bit farther out in terms of getting into that startup stage. Um, there are some amazing folks from a council perspective, securities council perspective that have been through it um, with a lot of the companies here in town. So I, I would say the legal counsel, your partner from a legal counsel perspective can provide a lot of really good advice early on of bumps in the road to avoid how much capital to give up. What form of capital do you give up? What does that agreement look like? Making sure that that shareholder agreement that you strike early on is one that will last you right through until you are at scale. Um, so I think all of those are important. That's really, that's really, really helpful. I might put in a little bit of a plug for a, for a BC Tech option too, which is, you know, explore our C councils, become a member of our, our BC Tech for Startups program. It's completely free as long as you're a qualifying startup, just fill in the application form. Um, and one of the services that we offer our members is, uh, well, it, it's a mentorship program, but we like to call it Encounters with a Dragon. <laughs> so it will be a That's private good. encounter with one of our BC Tech Dragons that have seen it all before and can maybe give you some steer on uh, where to go next for advice and for options. So yeah, and that that is so important having that dragon like experience, because, you know, so many times you present your idea, you're passionate about it, but it's about the packaging of the presentation. So ensure that you've got that packaging nailed and the dragons are those that see a lot of these and they see those that go through successfully and those that maybe need a couple of kicks at the can. And so nailing it right the first time is, is critical. That's a great, great opportunity. Thank you. So yeah, we're excited to sort of launch that in, uh, in January. Okay, well, let's see if we have any other questions in the chat. 
Uh, does anybody else have any other questions online? If not, I have one final question for Kathy. Okay, so Kathy, I just want to ask, and I, and I always ask this, but it, it's, it, it gets such rich answers, um, which is, do you have any advice? So what would be your one piece of advice to an ambitious entrepreneur, to an ambitious startup, just getting started? Uh, they have high ambitions, but what would you urge them to do? Yeah, and we did talk a lot about different pockets of ideas but you know one one thing and I and I discussed this question I must confess with my colleague Daniel Lee um, he is in Toronto he works only exclusively with private companies um, and so he's seen a lot he's seen a lot and I I take very a lot of guidance from him when working with private companies and his big thing was big go for the big idea um, don't get turned off um, big ideas are contrarian you know, sometimes the biggest idea, people are like, oh, I've never seen that before. That sounds dumb. Um, and he brought up the idea of Airbnb. Like, whoever thought that they would, they would rent a room or rent somebody's home or rent, um, they, it's just a weird idea. And lots and lots of folks turned down this investment um, and look back on it and said, I can't believe I actually turned down the opportunity to invest at the ground floor. Um, but his thing was, big ideas are contrarian because nobody's ever done them before. So don't get turned off from thinking that your idea actually could be one of those ones that changes the world. Um, so that that's his big piece of advice. And I thought, you know what? I like that. I'm going to go with that, but I'm going to also give credit where credit is due. Um, and, you know, when you're, when you're pitching an idea, we talked a little bit about this, but when you're pitching your idea, you're going to get so many no's. Um, and don't get discouraged about that either. Um, cause it, it's so rare that you, you know, the, the times of 2021, they're gone, they'll come again, but they're gone for now. Um, and those were the years in which you got lots and lots of yeses. Sometimes in a month you get a term sheet and close. Um, but now we're back to grit we're back to hard work and we're back to really selling yourself. So don't get discouraged and just keep, keep moving ahead. That's great. Well, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to give a shameless plug. You should definitely connect with CIBC, which sounds like an incredibly collaborative bank <laughs> where <laughs> you don't just get the, the wisdom of Kathy, you get the wisdom of all of her colleagues. So I, I, I'm happy to, to make that endorsement. Uh, so I do encourage you to do that. Uh, here's another question we have from the chat. Um, what do those tech startups look for? from their financial institutions um, when they're expecting fast growth? Is there a trend as far as where they hope to invest to build the business first? So this is sort of uh, the connection of tech startups, but looking to financial institutions who are looking to finance fast growth. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the one thing, CIBC acquired um, a firm called Wellington, about five years ago, and then rebranded at CIBC Innovation Banking. And I think what makes the professionals in that group unique, Joe Timlin is local here. A lot of people would know Joe Timlin, but he was a venture capitalist and now he's a banker. And so he, when you meet with him as a startup, as a scale up, whatever stage, you're talking to somebody who's seen a lot and can partner with you and give you great advice along the way. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing, honestly, is to choose a banker that is going to listen and really give you creative ideas on not, not just on, you know, the banking needs that you have right at that moment, but just great business sense and help you grow. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for that great question. Thank you for that great answer. It's a wonderful note on which to close out our conversation. So I'll just say thank you again, Kathy, for being with us today. It's been a fantastic conversation.